that I've discovered over the years. Um, there's nothing so humbling like when a student coming to your class have a lot of problems that you've never encountered before with anybody else and they need to have it fixed today. <laughs> and you don't have a solution right away. Um, but what I'd like to share with you today is something that has helped me in many, many ways and has led me to the root and the core of so many problems that cello, cello, cellists experience. Um, and I must give credit to my former uh, cello lecturer, Dalena Ru, for introducing this way of thinking and teaching to me in the first place, and on which I could build my ideas further. So, my topic for today is the two thumbs. <laughs> How to ensure that they stay part of the flow. Um, first, I need to explain what I see as the flow. Um, the flow to me is the line or the pathway uh, through which the energy of playing, of music making, need to go. So if you think of your body as a machine, I'll try and illustrate. Uh, you have to think a little bit imaginative. Uh, but for us as musicians, that's not difficult. <laughs> um, if you see your body as a, as a machine and you have an engine that you need to put on for the machine, the engine sits here. Um, it's your gut or your stomach or your yeah, the middle part of your body where, where the engine needs to start. Okay, so imagine you've put that engine on. Um, by the way, need a nice sitting position for that, which I won't go into now because that's a whole topic on itself. Um, but let's say the student has the correct sitting position and the engine is put on and you have a live and awake feeling and presence um, to play the cello. Then your next um, pathway for the energy now to go is to your spine. And once it's reached your spine, it goes up and down at the same time. Now I know that sounds silly, but if you only think of it like you, it, the energy goes up to the tip of the spine and it goes down to the bottom of your spine, you sort of elongate your spine. Those two energy pathways need to constantly stay while you play the cello. Then the next, um, door that we get in our path is now if we talk about the thumbs in the end we're going to look at the arms because there's pathways in the legs as well but let's just look at the arms um, is the muscle here right at the back of your shoulder where the scapula and the humerus of the upper arms bone is connected with a little bit of a swing like muscle or it looks like a banana shape and it's called the teres major and if you activate that muscle it's the same feeling as you would if you put your elbows in your side and someone would give you a little bit of pressure here and you resist it that way that is the same muscle that you would feel there at the back this is the picture that you see now in front of you is that muscle connecting the scapula with the humerus, upper arm. 
Okay, so that is the path, one of the doors in your pathway. So if you've gone through that door, it is open and you need to activate that muscle for your shoulder and your chest to stay open so the flow can continue. Okay, then your next door that you get in your path is your elbow area. Now, the elbow, uh, students tend to use the muscle surrounding the elbow um, to join the upper and forearm in a sort of cramped way where they block the elbow area. And you must be very careful that um, it always stays open um, and it doesn't break off the flow to the hand which you actually need to work with and the thumb that we are getting to. So, <clears throat> turn your um, upper arm uh, almost outwards so that the forearm can hang um, from the upper arm and the elbow is just like the hinge in the door that keeps the two together but it's not locking them in one big joint together. So that is the next doorway. Then we get to the next door in the path is the wrist. So if the wrist is cut off from the flow, it will eliminate the use of your fingers. And cut off, um, ways that students cut it off is by bending it like that. Now I don't say you can't bend your wrist. We need to, to come in at the frog here you know, on our string. So it's not that I say can't bend. It is a bend that sort of collapses in the whole arm and shortens the distance between the shoulder and the wrist. So if you lengthen that area between the shoulder and the wrist, you use that teres major at the back and then you can bend your and move your wrist as much as you like, but it won't stop the, the energy flow that's coming from the engine all the way. Okay, and then it brings me finally to the thumb. Um, so if all of these doors are closed and the pathway are um, um, not open, you will experience tenseness, pain, um, students suffering from all of sort of cramps. And, um, but if it's open, you will experience a natural, free, but strong thumb on the bow. Um, that brings me to the last point that I want to make in this, and that is um, the knuckles. So, still talking about how to keep the thumbs in the flow is the knuckles. Are still very, very important for us. We as cellists or our string players are presumed for the rest of all of us. Um, if you don't know where your knuckles are, <laughs> you can't... Um, let your fingers hang from them and thus using only fingers to articulate and um, not involve the whole hand or the whole arm, but that you are able to use your fingers separately. Um, and for that, I have a nice exercise with a pencil that my students usually like. Um, I make them hold the pencil like this. So it's more or less like a bow grip, but tell them just to take it with the fingertips and don't give too much attention to detail. And then you put it flat on your leg and you, you, you uh, make sure that they stay with their knuckles on the leg or the surface or the table or whatever. And then you need to do push-ups with your, with your pencil. So you push it up without using the rest of your hand, just the finger. And um, what they will do is things like this, so then they're using their wrist again, and the whole hand. So see to it that they don't, and they only use fingers, and you will be surprised at how um, students aren't able to connect the, the brain nerve pathway <laughs> to that, to only do that. Some of them is easier than others, but it's interesting to see. And then you turn it around, and you say this is a tabletop and you need to fall from there just to be aware of the knuckle. We're not necessarily going to do it as um, exaggerated in playing cello, but first let them experience the whole range of pulling it up so the 
it, it, it becomes a tabletop up to the middle knuckle of the finger and then you make them drop it up to the big um, knuckles here. Um, okay, so uh, um, I want to make the next point and that is um, we can use, we can change some small details here at both hands. So first of all for the right hand, if people have thumb issues and pain and aches, you can at least ensure that they um, hold the bow at the right place, um, that the thumb is um, point of contact on the stick and you will see now um, this picture. It tells you, it shows you that the thumb touches the bow at the corner of the nail and the right hand corner of the thumb. Um, and it's across your second finger. The same accounts for your left hand. It touches the back of the neck with the side of the thumb where it touches the nail. And um, the knuckles is like a, a bridge for your fingers to hang from. And then it creates your thumb to go a little bit downwards and forward instead of going like that from underneath the bow and actually pushing the bow away from your strings, which you obviously don't want. So the knuckles and the way the fingers can hang from the knuckles has a direct impact on the thumb. It, if the knuckles changes, the thumb angle changes. So that's something to look out for if, if there's some thumb problems. The same on this side. If we have a hand uh, grip here that's tucked in and from underneath, you will get a lot of thumb cramps and shoulder, by the way. <laughs> so the knuckles must need to be higher than the fingerboard. So again, the fingers can hang from the knuckle and the angle of the thumb is sort of from the side and almost downwards. So exactly the same on both sides, luckily. Um, so I get a lot of students, I ask them, can you release your wrist a little bit and make your knuckles higher? They would do this. I said, no, 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 not the elbow, the knuckles. But, and I can't do it. So the pencil exercise really, really helped to get your brain pathway to this point of the knuckles where you can um, manipulate your knuckles and where you can change it if you want to go higher with it or go flatter if you stretch you go a little bit flatter if you in a normal position again it goes a little bit higher and when you do vibrato it's also like you want it to be or a little bit sharper vibrato you can raise your uh, knuckles etc so it's a very helpful tool to have now, all of this said, the thumbs, yes, we can fix all of these little things here and look for it to be right. But if it's not part of the flow from where the engine starts, the thumb will never be right. <laughs> it's, you will find that you will repeat over and over again to the student, look at the thumb, don't squeeze the thumb, don't do that with the thumb, don't do that with the thumb. But all of that is trivial detail. If you actually just go to the root of the problem and that is that it's somewhere cut off and the thumb needs to work really really hard on both sides instead of opening up your whole flow from your engine and create a free resonant sound on the cello. Um, obviously it takes a while for you as teacher to recognize where the flow is cut off but I can really um, encourage you to create, to get new eyes when you look at your pupils for the flow. And um, it solves so many problems uh, that in the end um, has a root core from the flow. I hope this was a little bit helpful. Obviously I can't go into too much detail, but you're welcome to contact me. Um, and come and visit me here at the Johnny Music Centre. Thank you!